Uh, this is the third week we've been in a series here at Aldersgate. We're looking at different psalms, and we've been going through them and working through them. We started three weeks ago with Psalm 1. that challenged us that above all, we need to be in God's Word, reading the Bible, meditating it on it every day. We've challenged you as a church family, if you're here with us for the very first time this morning or uh, whatever, uh, we're going through a reading plan together on the Psalms. You're not reading chronologically 1 through 150, but you're reading thematically through the book of Psalms. If you didn't get one of these, you'll find paper copies like this in our Next Steps area right outside these doors. Or if you want to go online, aldersgatelive.org, you'll find the reading plan there. Uh, we hope you're reading through it with us. If you you haven't started, you can jump in today. You don't have to start right at day one. You can just jump in wherever. Uh, if you started reading and then kind of stopped reading, you just I would encourage you this morning to just pick back up where you left off or jump in on today's reading or, or whatever. But just get plugged in to reading God's Word and meditating on it. Last week, we were at Psalm 117, the shortest chapter in the Bible, and looked at God's inspiration to us in terms of worship and how to connect with God, and how to engage with Him, and how critically important that is, because He deserves it, and we need it. If you've missed any of these messages or any of the rest of them, you can get them online. I would encourage you to do that. This morning, we're going to be in Psalm 121, and uh, I've titled this message, Look Up. Uh, really, the extended title of it would be this, When the Going Gets Rough, Look Up. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I'm going to suppose in a room this big that some of you would admit this morning that the going is getting rough. Here's the encouragement. Look up. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. When the going gets rough, look up. Now, let me tell you what's happening here in Psalm 121. Psalms 120 through 135 are a group of psalms that are grouped together collectively. And they were a group of songs or, or poems that the Israelites would sing or recite as they were on their way to Jerusalem, the holy city, to celebrate in the festivals that God had set up for them. Now that was a mouthful, wasn't it? Jerusalem was the hub of all religious activity. It's where the tabernacle was. The tabernacle, the Old Testament tabernacle, you've heard a little bit about that here at Aldersgate if you got the video announcements this morning. If not, there's going to be more coming on that here in just a second this morning. But this, the, Old tabernacle, the Old Testament tabernacle was where God's presence dwelt. And it moved around in the wilderness as the Israelites moved around in the wilderness. And then Jerusalem became the center the hub of all religious activity, and the tabernacle was there. That's where God's presence dwelt. Later, the tabernacle was replaced by the temple when King Solomon built the temple. Uh, but God set up these religious festivals, and every so often during the year, the people would make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which was the holy city, and they would celebrate these festivals. And Psalms 120 through 135 would be sung or recited or whatever as they were making that pilgrimage. Psalm 121 is in that group. And what it's talking about when it talks there in verse 1 about lifting their eyes up to the hills, you have to know that Jerusalem was surrounded by mountains. If you still got your Bible open or if you're on your phone, you can flip over really fast to Psalm 125 verse 2. It says this, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. So Jerusalem was the city that was surrounded by mountains. And you can just picture this in your mind. I want you to picture this in your mind, Psalm 121, that as the people would make their way to Jerusalem, they would get to that place where they would begin to see the mountains. They would come more in focus, and they would lift their eyes up to the mountains. You've been in a place like this. Now, you may not have been to Jerusalem and the mountains around Jerusalem, but you've been coming home from a long trip, haven't you? And you've seen that marker that says to you, oh, 
we're home. Now, I, I grew up small town, small school, so let me tell you what it was for me. It was the water tower because it stuck out above everything else, right? The only other thing that would come close was the football lights. But when you were off in a distance and you would get close to home, you would see that and you would think, oh, man, we're home. Have you, have you ever been driving in the pitch black on your way home? I mean, there's nothing out there but darkness. And all of a sudden, way out there on the horizon, you begin to see these lights and you realize it's the lights of your hometown, where you're going. Are you all with me this morning? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. You know what that's like? That's what it was like for the Israelites to go to Jerusalem. And they would see the mountains and they would begin to think, oh, we're almost there. Yes, we're there. But it was more than just being there at Jerusalem. It was being there where God's presence was. I mean, in the Old Testament, God's presence literally dwelt in the tabernacle and the temple and the mountains. There's references, you know, you can go back and look at the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and you can go back and look at the mountain where, you know, Elijah had his showdown with Baal and all that kind of good stuff. But the mountains, and specifically the mountains around Jerusalem and the tabernacle, signified to the people that that's where God's presence was was now we know today that God's presence is everywhere right you can't run from God's presence you can't hide from God's presence God's presence is everywhere Paul tells us that we have God's presence that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit that's why when I was growing up this used to aggravate me I didn't understand till later but now it even aggravates me if I hear it you know when kids are running in church and you hear the parents don't run in the church You've heard that, right? Some of you are going, I've said that. Is that bad to say? And, because the church is the house of God. That's just bad theology. The church is not the house of God. You are the house of God, and you're screaming at your kid, right? We house the presence of of God, the very presence of God. Now we know that now, but in Old Testament, the presence of God was in Jerusalem. And so they're singing this song and they're so excited because they're lifting their eyes up to the hills because they're there where the very presence of God is. Here's the question I have for you this morning Where do you go for help? Where do you turn for help? I mean, the psalmist here, when they sing this song, they say, we lift our eyes up to the hills. That's where our help comes from. Not the hills, but the very presence of God. And I can ask you this question this morning. Where does your help come from? And because you're in church, the first answer you're going to give is Jesus. Right? Because that's the answer that's never wrong in church. It's like the time the pastor was doing the children's sermon and he called all the kids down to the front of the church and he was having conversation and dialogue with them and he asked the question, who won the Super Bowl last year? And this one little kid, he starts thinking in his mind, well, I know the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. This was obviously a very long time ago. I know that the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl, but I also know the answer he wants is Jesus because we're in church. That's how we do it, right? He finally spoke up and he said, the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl and I don't know how you're going to tie this into Jesus. But anyway, there you go. I can ask you this morning because you sit in church, where do you turn for help? Where do you go for help? And, and, and you would like to raise your hand and shout out, God. But can we just be honest this morning? Is that really where we go for help? Can we say that any time in our life where circumstances get overwhelming, when, when tragedy strikes, when something happens and we don't know what to do or where to go, can we honestly say that that's the first thing we think is to run to God? That that's where our help comes from? You see, and I don't think we can say it is because if we could say it is, then why would addiction exist in our culture? Because oftentimes the first place we want to turn or the first place we want to run is to the bottle or, or to the pill, whether it's prescription or non-prescription. I, I preached a message several months ago. It was this year. You can go back and find it. It was from James when it talks about uh, any of you being sick. It says, if you're sick, call the elders. 
have them anoint you, anoint you with oil, and pray over you. And, and I remember saying as clear as day in that message, listen, here's what that means. Anointing with oil was a medicine. It was prescriptive. Take your medicine. If life overwhelms you and you're on medicine, take your medicine. But is that the first place you go? Is that where you turn thinking that that's going to cover everything up and take care of everything and manage everything for you? Do you go to others? Is that the first place you go? There's nothing wrong with that. Certainly from one end of the Bible to the other, it talks to us about being in community and living with others and iron sharpening iron and those kind of things. But is that the first place you go? Do you go to vent your frustration before you even vent it to God? Where do you go for help? This morning I want to share with us some things based on Psalm 121 that keep us from looking up. That keep us from turning to God first. That keep us from crying out, help God, help. Here's the first one I would share with you. One of the things that keeps us from looking up is that we believe that God is unable to care for us. Now, I know when I first say that, you think that's kind of shocking to hear, especially from a preacher in church. But can we just be really gut level honest this morning and say that sometimes we don't believe God can take care of us? If you're reading through the Psalms, especially some of the ones that David wrote, you get to places in the Psalms where David wrote and he did not believe God could take care of him. Now, by the time you get to the end of the Psalm, there's been some resolution there. But when you first read the first few verses of some Psalms, you go, man, this David is jacked up. That's why I love David. Because we're all jacked up. You remember what we say around here? It's okay. To not be okay. But it's not okay to stay that way. It's okay to sit here and admit sometimes we don't believe God can take care of us. Sometimes we don't believe God can do it. Sometimes we don't believe He's big enough. Sometimes we just don't believe that God is able to take care of us. And we just have to get to the place where we can admit that sometimes in our lives when things become overwhelming. We just don't think God is able. Let me point you to Psalm 121. It says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now, when we read that, even when I read Psalm 121 this morning, you probably just kind of passed right over that. Especially if you're used to being in church. Because we're used to hearing things like, God made the heavens and the earth. And even if you're not used to being in church, you probably are used to hearing, God made the heavens and the earth. And we've heard it so many times, we just pass over it without even giving any thought to it. Can you think for just a moment about the magnitude of that statement? That God made the heavens and the earth. <laughs> just sit there and let that soak in. We've talked about meditating on God's word. If you're reading 121 this week, this is just one of the things you could stop and meditate on. <laughs> God made all of this. Look around. God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? He made all of this. When was the last time you watched the sunset? I just sat in awe of the, uns of the sunset. When was the last time you watched the sunrise? I, to those of you who watch online and you're not from here, let me just tell you, there is no better place in the world to watch sunrises and sunsets than right here. And how can we spend time watching the sun come up or watching it go back down and not be amazed at God? I'll tell you why. Because sometimes we get dull to it. 
And that same dullness is what allows us from time to time to say, God is not able to take care of me. Have you ever lately just spent some time outside in the evening when it begins to get dark, just gazing up into the sky? To the stars and all that's in the sky? Do you know that there are so many stars? I mean, they're like sand on the beach. There are so many stars, the experts, the people that study this kind of stuff, that don't like to admit they don't have the answer, will tell us that they can't even count the number of stars because there's so many of them. You know, one thing they can count, I read this week that scientists now tell us that they've identified 86 billion neurons in the average human brain. Now, I realize that some of you are operating at less than average, but 86 billion neurons. Think about it. Do you know that God knows everything there is to know about you? Because he formed everything there is to know about you. You keep going in Psalms 139, it talks about that. That even when we were in our mother's womb, God put us together. Intricately and delicately. That he knit us together. Psalm 139 also tells us this. We can't go anywhere from his presence. The psalmist in 121 says that too. Here's what he says. He says, he who keeps you will not slumber. You know what that means? It means he doesn't take a nap. It means when you have circumstances in your life that come upon you that are so overwhelming and so great, you don't think you'll ever be able to face them or get through them, he's not somewhere in the corner asleep. It goes on to say that he never goes to sleep. You can't run from him. You can't hide from him. He knows everything about you. When the angel showed up to tell Mary that she was going to give birth to Jesus, you know what the angel said? With God, all things are possible. If you're in a place where sometimes you just think God's not able to help, listen, it's okay to be there. But it's not okay to stay there. Meditate on the one who made the heavens and the earth. The one who flung the stars in the sky that we can't even count. The one who created and knows every intricate detail about us. The one who knows exactly what you're thinking right now. There's another reason that I think we don't look up or turn to God for help, and it's this. Because we don't believe God is willing to help us. We believe God is able. We believe God is fully capable. We believe God is all powerful. We don't believe He's willing to help poor little me, to help us. There are lots of reasons for that. Perhaps we think that we haven't done enough good things, or we haven't measured up. We haven't been in church enough times. Or we cussed last week and so God can't help us. Or we did turn to the bottle and so God can't take care of us. There's all kinds of reasons we think that sometimes God is unwilling to help us. And when we get into a situation sometimes and we're praying and we want God to answer and we want God to deliver and we have a way that we want God to do that and the answer doesn't come exactly the way we're looking for it, we say it must be us. It's got to be something I've done. It's got to be something I'm not doing. And if we're honest, we would say that sometimes we just believe God is not willing to take care of us. Can I show you out of Psalm 121? There's a word that shows up six times in these few verses. And that word, or a variation of that word, is the word keep. It it says things like, uh, He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. Six times. And that word keep literally means to take care of. To take care of. It's the same word that shows up in Genesis chapter 1 after God created Adam and put him in the Garden of Eden and said, keep it. Take care of it. 
And the picture that the author of Psalm 121 is giving us is that God will take care of us. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to enjoy perfect health and wealth. That doesn't mean that we're going to go through life without bumps and bruises. It doesn't mean we're never going to experience emotional or physical pain. In fact, the Bible guarantees that we will experience all of those ends of the spectrum. But here's what it tells us. That even if the outcome's not what we want, even if it's not what we're praying for, even if it's not how we thought God would come through, He is more than willing to take care of us. You know what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 31? He says this, If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? He goes on to say, Neither height, nor depth, nor width, nor any of that can separate us from the love of God. Of God. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Why? Because God is for us and He is always willing to help us. It doesn't matter where you've been, it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter how you answer the question, where do I turn for help? And it doesn't matter where you're currently going for help. It doesn't matter how deep in the bottle you are. It doesn't matter how strange your situation with your friendships are. None of that matters. God is for you, and he's always willing to help you. Sometimes we think he's not able. Sometimes we think he's not willing. Here's another reason we don't look up. Sometimes... We just flat out believe we don't need God to help us. Sometimes we get in places in life where we are just so prideful we think we've got it all together. Sometimes we get in places in life, even when circumstances overwhelm us, we think we know the best answer. And we think we know how to handle it. And we think we can just reach down, grab on, and be a little bit more disciplined and everything will be fine. If we're honest this morning, we would say sometimes we don't look up to the heels. We don't look up to God's presence. We don't turn to God because we think we've got it. And here's what we do. We turn inward. We turn to our gifts and our abilities. We turn to our talents. We turn to our charisma and our charm. We turn to our job and the security that we have there. We turn to others. There's all kinds of places that we can turn. And in essence, we're saying, I've got this, God. I'm good. You see, we cry out, I lift my eyes up all over myself. There's one word, and it's found in 121. There's one word that takes us from that prideful place to a deeper relationship with God. There's one word that takes us from self-sufficiency to complete dependency on God. You know what the word is? Help. Help. God, help me. I lift my eyes up. Where does my help come from? From the Lord. From God, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Where do you go for help? Where right now are you currently turning to help? Where's the first place you go without even thinking about it? Where do you spend the majority of your time looking for help? All of those places may be right, but where's your first turn? I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel 
will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. You're going out and you're coming in from this time and forevermore. God, we come to you this morning and we acknowledge to you that we are not okay. God, we thank you that it's, it's a good thing to come into this place and say we are not okay. But God, this morning we ask that you speak to us about what it means to not stay that way. God, all across this room, up on this platform, in the life of the one talking right now, there are circumstances there are odds that are stacked against us. There are questions we have. Life is upon us. And God, it's our prayer this morning that we would look up, that we would lift our eyes up to you, that we would cry out for help. God, in the places right now in this room where we're tempted to say that you're not able you would bring us to creation, to your heavens and the earth, and help us to see that you are completely able. God, if we're honest, there's places in this room this morning where we would say, we know you're able, God, but we just don't think you're willing. Why would you do that for me? Some of us are striving so hard to get to a place where we feel like if we can get to that level, then you'll finally come through for us. And God, would you just show us this morning that you keep us, you take care of us. It may not always look the way we think it should look, but you take care of us and you keep us. And God, would you move us from a place of pride and self-sufficiency this morning to a place of complete, utter dependence and trust in you. Help us to cry, help, God. Help us to cry out to you and look up and see the way you move in and work. God, I pray in this room right now for your power to be at work. In the tragedies, in the circumstances, in the overwhelming places of life, God, I pray that you bring us to our knees, that you would help us to raise our hands and cry out help. God, as we open up this time, as we sing a song, that we would flood the altar. God, that we would come down and we would say, we're not okay, we don't want to stay that way. That we would lift up our hands and say, God, help us. Help me with wherever we're at. We ask it in Jesus' name.